there now welcome back to the workshop on today's episode i'm going to take you guys through the rebuild of a set of these uh rockers and um, a lot of people uh in the comments on the last video asked for the rockers and i'm just actually at the point now i have one of those cooper s cylinder heads fully rebuilt myself and billy are building the video on rebuilding the second of the cooper s videos but i thought a nice video that i could get out for you guys uh, in kind of two parts and nice and straightforward would be the rebuilding of these rockers it also so just happens that loads and loads of you commented and said you'd really like to see the rebuild of the rockers so uh, in this first part what we're going to do is we're going to look at the tower assemblies which is what uh, the rockers mounted the cylinder head with and we're going to start having a look at the rockers themselves uh, and figuring out what needs to be replaced, what can be kept, and what can be repaired. Straight away, when I look at these rockers, um, something very, uh, I suppose, uh, different stands out. And one of our commenters, uh, Tony, who is an ex-BMC guy, um, worked in um, uh, the production lines of the likes of the Cooper S's, made a very good point to me about the placement of the hold down pin, and if I get one of my little pointy screwdrivers, this uh, hold down dowel or this hold down pin. So basically inside this rocker shaft here is a groove is drilled into it. And that, uh, I suppose grub screw is probably the best description for it, screws down and locks into it and stops this shaft from being able to rotate. These are a very early set of rockers and we can tell that one by the shape of the actual rocker itself but two, by the position of where this um, grub screw is. Generally speaking, that grub screw would actually be in the middle here, in one of the, well, it's actually on the second tower in here rather than on that tower. So one of the modifications we're doing is we're gonna replace the rocker shaft for one of my own rocker shafts. These are a rocker shaft made up from what I think is the best possible material to make a rocker shaft from and it's what we call gun drilled EN21. Now, the big difference with this rocker shaft, one is the material, it's EN21 steel. Uh, the, not sure what the factory original rockers were, but I know 90% of the rocker posts or rocker shafts you can buy uh, and the, from the aftermarket suppliers are EN8 and they're unheat treated EN8 or very likely heat treated EN8. The second thing is, this is what we call gun drill bar, which is where it has a hole drilled down through the center of it. Now that's very important because that's what allows the oil run to all the different field feed, sorry, to all the different feed holes. So you've got all the different feed holes along the bar. I have this gun drilled at six millimeters, uh, which means that I get a really heavy wall thickness, uh, which makes this bar incredibly strong and gives it plenty of uh, rigidity. I'm told that the reason why the factory moved from uh, having the uh, mounting hole out here at the end to in here at the middle was for rigidity and strength. And that would kind of make sense. Having it all the way out here at the very end means you could get a lot of torsion going along this bar with all the friction from each one of the rockers. And adding that kind of twisting motion to the rocker shaft, I suppose in fairness, could lead to a shearing of the shaft. While the shaft may look like a big strong piece of kit, it has drillings through it all the way along. All of those drillings are in there to let oil feed the rockers. And when you think about it, they're all weak points. If we've got the anti-twist down here at the very end of the shaft, and we've got all the forces happening up here, then each one of these holes is going to be a stress razor and it's going to cause the potential for problems. Okay, let's get this uh, set of rockers stripped. Uh, I already took out one of the pins and I did that uh, about two weeks ago uh, when these first arrived in the shop because I just wanted to make sure by doing a, a bit of measuring uh, with the old gasometer. Well, I suppose people would call it the vernier calipers. It was a gasometer to me. Uh, so we did just a little bit of measuring just to make sure, given that these were such an old set of rockers, that the uh, bushings inside the rocker were still at the same dimension uh, that the new bushings that I would have in stock were. And they are, they're identical. So uh, that was just one of those things that you wanted to check. I was actually 
pleasantly surprised. I reckon these are pretty low mileage rockers and I can tell by one or two things. There's very little wear here on the foot. Uh, that foot there is what the valve actually uh, runs on or it runs against the valve to open and close it. And there's very little wear. I can't actually feel anything with my fingernail. And normally you would. And your fingernail, believe it or not, is a really good um, sense. A good colleague of mine in the States said to me that you can, the measurement of surface finish is in RA. Uh, or an RA is, is a very good measurement or a, a style of measurement, like millimeters is for length, RA for uh, surface roughness. And uh, a very good friend of mine said that uh, he was a painter, now not a machinist, but uh, he said you'll feel RA uh, down to about five or six. Um, obviously the lower the RA number, the smoother the finish is with your nail. So uh, we're getting anywhere near RA five or six <laughs> with the surface of a rocker, uh, with, uh, rocker foot, we'll be very happy. Um, you know, when I tried this on one of my shafts, to be honest with you, there's very little play. Now there is play, which is one of the reasons why we are going to go ahead and uh, change these out. But f for what is a factory original rocker, it kind of amazes me uh, that I'd love to know what kind of miles they've done because they feel great on that rocker shaft. One of the nice things about the way the mini uh, rocker is made, uh, it's a bronze bush running on a steel shaft. And generally speaking, the steel shaft from the factory was soft. So most of the wear ended up happening in the steel shaft rather than in the bronze bush. So uh, that would kind of stand to reason why there's very little in it. Generally speaking, the size of those, um, I'll pull the number off the top of my head now. It's around 0.585, I think. Um, it's 500 thousandths and change anyway, uh, is the diameter that that shaft should be, uh, which uh, when we measure just with the snap gauges, the inside of these, we were just a hair over the top tolerance. So we'll have to change those. Second thing I don't like on these is this uh, lock nut that we can see here. There's a lock nut on these and to be honest, I just wasn't very happy with the style of the lock nut. Uh, it's been replaced at some stage, it's not the proper. What should actually be on these is a thing that's called a jam nut. And I have the proper jam nuts here, uh, which are factory original style jam nuts, they're brand new. Uh, and a jam nut is a very different thing to the likes of a lock nut. One, these are made on a much higher grade metal. Um, I have these, I imported these or I bring these in and they are in grade 10.9. So they're a much stronger material. And the second thing is you can see the size of this nut. You're adding a huge amount of weight to each rocker by adding that nut on there. Believe it or believe it not, weight lost in the rocker geometry can make a huge difference to valve train wear, valve train quietness and ultimately valve chain reliability. So getting these back to the proper lock nut is the right way to go. Something else that I've noticed on a couple of these is that there is a bit of a curvature to the, it's gonna be very hard to tell on camera. I don't know if you'll actually get it, but I might try and see if I can get a close up of it. Um, there, see how that works. Do you want it in the light maybe, Bill, or can we see it? So we have a bit of a curvature going on here to the end. I just spun these all the way out to the end and you can see that the end of them have a little bit of curvature. You can tell this really quickly because these don't spin in and out freely in and out of the threaded portion here. So we're gonna replace these. I have a brand new set of those as well. So we'll replace these, the jam nut and the uh, bronze bush that's inside there. Now when these bronze bushes come, they don't come reamed. So when you put a new bronze bush in there, it has to be reamed to size. And doing that is very definitely not a simple process. I have a jig set up for doing it that allows me to ream these. I ream them by hand, but in a jig um, to allow me to ream these square and true. I'll show you that. It won't be in this episode, it'll be in the next one, but it'll be worth doing. The very first thing I want to do is I want to continue on stripping these down. So let's just take out that lock and screw there. And generally these are not very tight, which is why I can just get them with a pliers. Um, generally speaking, these uh, are held with a little plate. I'll show you the plate later on. It sits across the two holes and has a slot in it to hold that. You don't want that grub screw really tight down in there because otherwise 
you'll create a wedging effect and you could potentially split that shaft so it's supposed to be snug but not wedged in there it's a nice thing to try and keep these in order is there a requirement for to have them in order now absolutely not because we are completely rebuilding this whole assembly but if i was keeping these on an engine that i uh, had run before it can make sense to keep them in order because if you find a damaged one of these it might help you find a damaged push rod and maybe even a damaged lobe on the camshaft so there is sometimes good reason or good uh, point to keep them in order for us it's not that important because we're completely rebuilding it and the whole engine that these are going on is being completely rebuilt by coal so uh, not such a big deal run out of space here now i'll be off into the dog run if i keep going here so that's it that's what's on our rocker post and the other two ones of those washers are there somewhere where i took them off uh, oh they're there they sit that in washers and spacers okay let's jump them back in the back so that's the original so i'll just show you the difference now between the original rocker post and our rocker post. So what you'll see is that the original rocker post has a very thin wall, whereas our rocker post has this big, really heavy wall. And that is a huge difference in the strength of it. One of the things to note, these early uh, rocker posts uh, used a treaded bung inside here. That's a lovely little piece of engineering for the original stuff. So it's an actual treaded bung in there. Our ones, what we have is we have a hot roll pin pressed in there and that's retained by the sear clip that goes through. So there's no way it can come out. But just a lovely bit of engineering that went in there to make that back in the day. The newer ones that you will see don't have that treaded bung. They just have a brass bung pushed in there like a, I suppose you would say like a kind of a frost plug or, you know, something like that. Just a little brass bung that's pressed in there. Okay. So what is the order of operations to rebuild one of these properly? Or how do I go about rebuilding one of these properly here in the shop? The order of operations for me is first of all to get the towers, which are these blocks that are going to be mounting down to the cylinder head flat. You might think, sure they, of course they're flat, you know, they're um, machined from the factory and, you know, there won't be anything in it. Of all of the rebuilds that I've done on these, and I can't tell you the countless numbers of these that I've rebuilt over the years, I've never once taken one of these apart, and I'm talking about original factory stuff, where these towers have all been within two or three hundred thousandths of each other. There's nearly always, even with the gasometer on them, you'll see a difference in the different tower heights. So that one's in at 42.25. So that one comes in at 42.21, 42 42.1, 41.68, okay, and I know it's the guess I made it, but if I got a, uh, a, a micrometer and put them on it, we would find that there would be differences across all of those tariffs. So uh, a few years ago, I built a jig for the milling machine uh, that allows me to get these towers mounted and I can skim them completely flat on both sides so that I know I start off with a tower that is completely flat and ready to go. The very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wash these in the parts washer just to get all the grease and oil off them and then we'll get set up on the mill. So I'll see you over at the mill. We're back over at the bridge port now and I'm going to show you just exactly how it is that I get these uh, rocker posts into squareness. I'm going to take just one moment to thank everybody who is subscribed to the channel. As always, you know, you mean so much to me as uh, part of this little community that we have. I know recently uh, our videos have been a little bit slower and I do appreciate everybody who comes back and watches the last video. got just absolutely fantastic support. So thank you so much, everybody. You've taken some pressure off of me in that you're still supporting the channel and you're keeping on viewing it and I'm still getting to get through the work that I need to get done. So it, I, it doesn't go unnoticed. I am trying to keep on top of the comments and reply to everybody as much as I can. And I do really, really appreciate the fact that everybody is being patient and uh, waiting for the content to come in. So thank you so much. To people who might be new here watching this, uh, you are most welcome to the channel. 
We are a little community of engineers, uh, car enthusiasts, mechanics, and everything in between all of that. You are most welcome into our little community here. Uh, if you like what you see, give us a like and maybe even share it with other people you think that would be interested in this little community. Uh, for those of you who are longtime subscribers, thank you so very much. And let us get in here into doing these rocker posts. So what I have is a little jig that I built and this block of aluminium is actually, it does a lot of different jobs. Uh, one of those is it works as a jig for this rocker post. This is something that I learned off another engineer years ago, having a piece of stock material that's, you know, got good level of flatness to it and is easy to machine and to work on the mill machine is always a great thing to have around your shop for quickly making up jigs. And this jig is very, very simple. All it is is an old rocker shaft that I uh, cleaned up and I drilled three holes and tapped them M6. Now it'll all become very clear in a minute why exactly I did that. They're just M6 cap head screws then underneath here. I leave them stick out just a little bit because when I put it down on the milling table, I can line them up with the groove at the back of the table. And I know that my rocker post is in line with the slots of my milling machine. I can clamp it down and I know when I take a pass across, I'm gonna be within um, a few thousandths off of square, more than enough for what we want. So how this works is pretty simple. Back out these couple of uh, cap head screws. And there's not much into doing that. And that will free up our rocker post. We can then get the rockers that we want to turn or make into flat rocker posts and we can slot them on. So we have four of them. So the way I've done this for uh, the last while is I put them on uh, always making sure that they're pointing in the same way and then just spread out across the three fixings. They don't have to be, you know, in a very particular spot. They just need to be spread out rough and, you know, fairly even. The first pass is going to always be on the top and that is to square up the top of them. This bit can be a little bit fiddly, just getting the bolt in and getting it to screw. It might be difficult for Billy to get you an angle of this. If I kind of turn this out this way. The bolts come through here and they pick up with a threaded portion in here in the uh, rocker post. And then I just get in with my Allen key then and I can lift them up. So all this is, is a fixture plate. Uh, anybody who's worked a CNC machine to make parts over the years will know exactly what a fixture plate is. It's something that allows you to very accurately hold something flat square and strong so I just run across these and these don't have to be very very tight this is just literally to hold these rocker posts flat and even so now I can put my plate in there and as you can see like the spacing's not dead even you know that one's a little bit closer than that one's a little bit closer than those it doesn't matter once all the posts are held down and they're held down evenly it sits in there on the table and then all I have to do is come in here with a toe clamp on the milling machine. I normally put the toe clamps kind of angling opposite each other, you know, one kind of that way, and then the other toe clamp kind of over there, kind of opposite that way. And I only really do that to try and keep them out of the way of the fly cutter when it comes along here now in a minute to, to surface these. So keep them up there nice and tight. Uh, Get the right size spanner, come in here. And of course, I'll be all fingers and thumbs now because the camera is on, but we do this in sleep at this stage in the game. And come up with one on those. Bring them in, hold that in position. And this bit of fixturing now just allows me to have these uh, this rocker post just held in here really nice and tight and clean I have not to worry about anything moving around here I know everything is going to be held neatly and tightly you know that's where it needs to be we can give those rocker posts a little tap and they are held down more than firm enough 
for the fly cutter to come in. Fly cutting as an operation doesn't require massive fixturing on any particular component because generally speaking fly cutting uh, there, there might be high tool uh, tip load but for the material the thing you're cutting very little as long as there's kind of no wiggle in them and they're uh, held down flat that's all that matters you could probably do this in another way you could probably do it in the mill and vice somehow by holding it but i want to get these line flat and the line here is the 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 shaft so what i really really care about is is that this shaft is square to this plate and is square to the cutter because what we want to end up with is we want to end up with the shaft perfectly parallel with the cylinder head so the very first cut we're going to do is we're going to take a cut across the top of these rockers which are going to make them flat then we'll flip this arrangement and the treads as you can see come through this side so we'll flip this over exactly as it is now flip it over and we'll take a cut across the other side and what that will guarantee for us is that these are now square with this and are square with this so when these go on the cylinder head the next time there won't be any differences in height and there won't be any differences in flatness. To do this operation, I have what might look like an incredibly janky looking fly cutter. I built this myself um, from an old uh, right hand laid cutting tool. Um, it has a couple of pinch screws on it, a bit of a balance weight on there, and it's R8, so it fits uh, into the, um, it fits up here into the spindle of the milling machine. But this fly cutter, for me, gives me a really nice surface finish. I get um, good stability out of it, and it cost me pennies. Um, and there's, you know, brilliant fly cutters out there that you could buy. You know, uh, I'm trying to think of some, Sunoco, I know, make a really brilliant fly cutter. Tormac, the big CNC machining company, they make brilliant ones. But they tend to be a lot of money. And... Uh, as you know, uh, here in my shop, um, we'll try and, if we can make it, and we can make it as good, or to give us a finish. Really, in surface cutting, there's a brilliant guy uh, out there. He runs a YouTube channel called Tubla Kane, and uh, I learned a lot from, from him uh, over the years, watching his uh, YouTube channel, and, uh, he always says the three R's in machining, uh, <laughs> which is the first R is for rigidity, the second R is rigidity, and the third R is rigidity. And that's exactly what he was saying. Uh, when you want to machine any material, the most important thing you can ever get into your uh, fixturing, into your tooling, or anything that's uh, involved in the job is rigidity. And, uh, you know, the bridge part here gives us rigidity uh, from the point of view of how it itself is structured and then the tooling we add to it we're looking for rigidity and this fixturing plate again giving us rigidity so that we get the best surface finish we can a lot of people think the surface finish comes from you know um, how well uh, the, the tool itself cuts and really in the case of this I'm using carbide inserts and it's a cast iron insert I'm using here uh, and that cast iron insert that's designed for cutting these materials. Now what I'm doing here at the moment is I'm doing what's called touching off, which is just literally using the tool itself to scrape across the top and see uh, how we got differences in height. So this one here is locking up the tool. So that is our highest uh, rocker post. And I'm gonna come back up onto that again and just touch off on it. You can use a piece of paper here as well. Often will work very well. Um, put a piece of paper between the cutter and the piece of material and see, we're just touching on that one. This is a real good example now of the difference in these different rocker post heights. Um, it'd be interesting just to see how much is in it between this post and this post. I know this piece of material is dead flat and it's sitting dead flat on my uh, cutting table here. So the difference in height between the two of these touching, we'll just bring in the old, um, Let's bring in the uh, uh, mag base here and just see exactly uh, how much this is. This is more just now for shits and giggles than it is anything, but um, let's just see 
Put that on there. Uh, how much in height this moves when we... Just to see what the actual difference is. So set him up on zero. So let's see how much we have to come up in order for this to... Okay, we're just touching there. So uh, 10, 20, 20. So 0.28 mil in the difference between that rocker post there and that rocker post there, 0.28 mil. And this is what I was saying to you. Um, I've never ever done one of these in this fashion where there hasn't been that uh, kind of big difference. So that'll be more than enough of a cut to take, to be honest with you. Um, let me just see where we're at at that. Okay, that's more than enough of a cut to take for our first pass on this. And all that's literally going to do um, is it's gonna to barely touch that one. It's probably start touching that one a little bit. It'll clean that one up and it'll clean that one up. We might even actually come off a little bit um, from that. I'm gonna come back. Yeah, I'll come back. 0.1, uh, lock the table there at that. Okay, so I'm gonna run up the machine. I'm gonna take a pass across here. Um, which, I'll just make sure we're not gonna hit our clamp. Oh, we are gonna hit our clamp there. So before you start the machine, it's always a good idea to check these, so we'll replace that uh, clamp there for a lower one. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about to modify this to make it better, I'm thinking of drilling holes in it and putting cap head Allen screws in it so that I can have a, a don't need these toe clamps at all then I'll just be able to use a um, a cap head screw straight into a um, straight into a, a, a slot a t-nut uh, which I can put into the t-slots of the machine and it would mean that I'd have even more uh, free room you know not worrying about the cutter hitting anything let's bring that guy back now okay so we've got that running clear which is what we want so start them in the machine nice and slow and we'll bring it up to speed. Just make sure we've got the brake off. We have. So. Oh, we've got to spin it in the right direction anyway. <laughs> So I'm spinning this around 350, 350, 360 RPM. Um, and for fly cutting, that's more than enough. We'll use the automatic feed. And we'll take a skim pass across this. Okay, so we've run the first pass across this and uh, when we get in here and we have a look at it, what we see is that the cutter has barely, barely touched this post. Uh, you can see the kind of light and shade between the two. It touched it here and it hasn't touched it here at all. The second post hasn't touched it at all. Third post here you can see uh, mostly completely cleaned it up and this final post touched it at the tip here hasn't touched it down here. And this is a really good example of what I was talking about when I was saying that uh, you may think that uh, you know a material is flat or that something is you know from the factory would be right, but you'd be sorely mistaken. What we're gonna do now is run another couple of passes of the fly cutter over this. Then we'll flip these over, we'll bring you back and we'll show you the results of the first fly cut on the other side and see what the differences are there. We've skimmed the side that you've seen, the top of them, and it took another two more spring passes. I'd say we, we took in total 0 0.33, 0 0.34 off the top of the posts, off the high ones to bring the low ones into uh, clearance. Now, truthfully speaking, the top, uh, the height of the top of the posts is kind of irrelevant because it's just where the cylinder head bolts clamp down to. However, the height of the bottom would be really, really important because obviously um, it sets where they sit on the cylinder head. And if these heights are different, what happens is you get um, 
uh, pressure on one post rather than the other, or it, and it's leaning then one post is pressing harder than the other. So what I've done, just to give you an idea, we now know that the other side are flat and are completely square with our post. So I've flipped them over and I've just set up the dial indicator gauge here, zero on that one. So let's roll across these and see what the different measurements we get. So we were zero on that one. So let's just see what this one comes in at. Nice and gentle as we come across it there. So that one, uh, point off three, that wouldn't be too bad. Point off three would be okay. Be within tolerance, I'd be okay up to about point off five. Let's see what this one gives us. Okay, that one's in on zero. That's pretty good. Let's see where this one's at. Nice and gentle coming up to it. And probably just shy of the zero, but near enough. So this gives us one really nice thing. Technically speaking, now that we have that done, we can measure and tell that these are actually really close to flat. Uh, now, the big difference is if I go across and back them, and I did do that while I had them in this position, and the difference between the front and the rear of them leaves a little bit to be desired. There's 0.2 on some of them, 0.1 on the others. So in other words, while they are flat across the post, they're not flat front to back on the post. Again, front to back on the post doesn't make as big a difference, but it's still, look, if you can get them perfect, why not get them perfect? So this is gonna require just a very light skim across the top of these, and that's gonna bring them into true. They're already very, very close. I have seen on the more modern Sinter type ones, the differences across these even as far as 0.5 of a millimeter, which seems absolutely ludicrous, but it is a real number. In order for all of this to work, obviously my fixture has to be good and I have to know that there's no deviations in this spindle bar and there isn't, I know this is a good bar. If you're ever gonna try and do this stuff at home, I'd honestly say to you, without the likes of fixturing like this, it will be very, very difficult to do this accurately. You could put inaccuracies into the valve train very easily. Uh, I'm well set up here with the right measuring equipment and the right tooling to do this job. Outside of being able to do it in the shop here like this, uh, it probably wouldn't be advisable. You'd want to get somebody, an engineering uh, company like myself, who are well set up to do these kinds of jobs and to get into it. So what I'll do is I'll do one last touch off on this uh, to bring it into, um, and I can, I can use any one of these rockers to touch off of now because of the fact that we've gone across them and we know, roughly speaking, the heights that we're at. Let some tension off the knee, bring it in there until we get our zero. Bring that cutter back out again. And we'll take, we'll just take five thousandths. Well, sorry, not five thousandths. Here you go, Paul. Point or five, point one. Take point one off. We'll run one skim on this and then I'll show you the next operation. We have these lovely and flat now. The what I had said to you before, there was a little bit of a lean on them. They're all dead square. So they're square to the, to the top face and the bottom face and they're dead square with the rocker post shaft. Next one, uh, at the start you'll remember I said, we wanna move that locking pillar into the middle. So we've gotta drill a hole and tap it for a grub screw here. And then in the outside pillar, the one that's gonna be where the oil feed is from the cylinder head, we've gotta drill a hole all the way through and chamfer it. So what I've done is I've put a line right through the middle of the rocker, which is through the two holes. I've now centered my counter, uh, my spot drill on the original hole in the rocker in the middle. So now all I have to do is to bring my uh, table slide over and then we'll bring it to line it up with the line we have in the middle of the rocker post and I have a spot punch there where I think it should end up and I'm getting pretty much there. I'm going to use a tiny bit more light on this so that I can see if I'm right and I am. So last thing to do is to just run the spot drill, take the brake off the milling machine. <laughs> so we'll run the spot drill. I'm gonna drill the rest of the way through with 3.5 millimeters, which will be all the way through into the shaft. 
I'm gonna drill this five millimeters, tap it M6, and then I'll back to you for the final and last operation on these posts. We're on the very last operation now on these rocker posts. And what we're actually doing is we're bringing in the surface here into true. So this is square with the bore inside here. This is square with the bore inside of here and the top of this. And the last operation we want to do is make sure that this trust face here on both sides is also at a 90 degree angle to, or well, it's coplanar anyway. So what we have is we've got a parallel set up here in the machine vise. We put the rocker post in, sitting on that parallel. And then the machine surfaces, these are highly accurate ground machine surfaces, either side of this. We bring them in. They are now holding this square in this plane. And really all this uh, parallel down the bottom is there for is to make sure that we are sitting flat in this direction. So we want to make sure that we're not sitting in the vice this way a little bit or in this vice or in the vice a little bit this way. We're just giving this a little tap and we can hit this surface with a steel hammer because we're about to machine it. We give it a little pinch and then exactly as before, we bring our cutter in and we'll come in here to the mid section and then we're bringing up our table until we get our scratch pass. So we just hear that cutting starting to turn a little bit there now. So we're just bringing that up. Okay, so we're just scratching there now. Back that out. Run the milling machine, and we're gonna dial in 5,000 depth of cut. We're just hand feeding across now at a 5,000 depth of cut. Gonna dial in another 5,000. This should clean up the surface now. Bring that out, flip that over. <laughs> Dial in our five thousandths. Should be our final pass now. Okay. So now, uh, last thing I want to just check is to make sure and I have that at 17 mil, which I've set the rest of these guys to. So that one there, 17.1, 17.12, 17 17.1, 17.13. So what I now have, and again, if we go back over these, I know it's only the guesso meter, but we'll still just Look at those, so 41 41.36, 41.36, 41.37, 41.36, okay. As accurate as that gauge will go, these are probably more accurate than the, that very near calipers can measure. So what we now have is we have four brand new remachined rocker posts. And it might seem like I've spent a whole video just machining rocker posts, but these are the absolute heart of rocker uh, geometry. They're the heart of a stable rocker setup. And time spent here will massively multiply down the road when we have a good bearing fit, when we have a good rocker geometry having these posts as well machined as these are now and as accurate as these are now will mean that our, our rocker geometry when it meets the cylinder head which again is a piece of engineering that we have had at here and brought it all into clearances will mean that when cole puts this cylinder head together using these rockers using the cylinder head that we've built him he will have a lovely smooth quiet running 
and very reliable valve chain geometry. A lot of people think in the mini world that everything is fit and forget and a good pal of mine uh, over on another channel, AC Dodd, often uh, says you can literally pick nothing up and bolt it straight on and he's absolutely correct. Every single component in a mini engine needs to be checked. It's not to say that every single component needs to be altered but you certainly need to check it to see whether it does need those kinds of alterations or not. The kind of work we're doing here in the shop on a daily basis is exactly that. That's why there is so much time taken. That's why uh, the product goes out and we can give it our name and we can be confident with it because we have spent the time fabricating the jigs, spent the time understanding the problems and rectifying them before they become a problem. I really hope you enjoyed coming along with me in this video. In the next part of this video, part two, and it will be the final part on rockers, we will take the bushings out of the uh, rockers themselves. We will uh, true up the rockers. We will install new bushings and ream them to size and assemble up the rocker um, uh, kit completely. So that'll involve the springs, the rocker shaft, the locking plate and everything else that's in it. I know probably one or two of you are wondering about the drilling and just to show you, uh, so that was the original post that was down one end and what we have now done, I'll get the Allen key here. What we have now done is we have drilled and treaded the old original hole which was there, drilled and treaded that and we've installed a bung and that bung just goes in there. It's literally just a grub screw. We'll, when we're finally assembling that, we'll put that in with a little bit of Loctite and lock it up. And what that will stop is, it'll stop any oil going down there and getting lost across the bottom. The second thing we did, find rocker post one now, there it is. That's going to be rocker post one now. We uh, did a countersink. We did a four mil and then a three mil hole, which comes up right in on the rocker shaft. And we've actually checked that by putting the rocker shaft into position and pushing the drill through and feeling it go right through into the rocker shaft. That uh, hole there is specifically designed to allow oil come up from the um, cylinder head, the drilling in the cylinder head. It'll allow oil to come up from the drilling in the cylinder head, pass through the rocker post into the rocker shaft and feed all of the rockers with oil. Again, this is the kind of stuff that you need to be on top of. Uh, to make sure that you end up with the right one. Thank you very much, Mr. Tony, uh, who is a loyal subscriber on the channel. He put a comment in uh, which uh, helped me remember the differences between Cooper S early and the later Cooper S and modern rocker posts. Uh, and it allowed us to make sure we could get this modification done right and done correct. He told me how they did it in the factory originally. We've replicated that there and I think we have a good job. Hopefully you enjoyed and we'll see you guys on the next one.